Thank you all for joining us. Um, I will hand over to Sonia um, and then we'll get going. Hello everyone. It's um, sunny in Oxford for, for someone, but it's not reached this side of Oxford yet, so I'm waiting. Um, welcome. Thank you for um, taking the time this morning to join um, this LUPC SCPC Responsible Procurement Group meeting. So, um, shall we move to the first item of business then um, with Jatim um, and move on to his presentation? Thank you so much. Uh, I thought for a moment the fire alarm was about to go off, but luckily it hasn't yet. So, uh, thank you so much, Sonia, for the introduction and, and and allowing me to do this. So, um, today, obviously, um, I'm presenting the sustainable laboratory procurement to the uh, to the group. So, thank you so much. So, I'm going to be doing a bit of a profity here and saying, next slide, please, if that's okay. Thank you so much. So just a brief introduction as to who I am. Some of you may may or may not have met me before. Uh, my name is Shatin Ahmed. I am the Head of Technical Services at Aston University in actually what is our College of College of Health and Life Sciences. Um, I am also the Chair of the SUPC Laboratory Group and the Chair of the STEM and National Procurement Group. And just to throw in some danger in my life, I'm also the Radiation Protection Supervisor for our facilities and Aston itself. So. I've worked in laboratories for more than 20 years. I've started off as a trainee laboratory technician and worked my way up and have had a, an interest in a variety of different areas such as, you know, sustainability, um, technician commitment and procurement. So, you know, I've got a bit of a bit of it all, to be honest, if that makes sense. So uh, next slide, please. Before I forget, I'm going to set a challenge to you all, if, if you're all into social media, to sort of uh, tweet this presentation if you want to, or LinkedIn it, or, or Facebook, or Instagram it. So I, I always challenge people when I do these things to see if they listen or enjoyed it, or probably not. Hopefully you do enjoy it, to do at least three of these tweets or, or something to that effect, so that at least then we can promote the good work you guys are doing as well. So let's start off with the journey, first of all. So what we always have and what is always traditional, I, I feel sometimes, is the end user versus the procurement battle view, which is end users always sit there and think, well, procurement is always, you know, seen as a red tape or getting in the way, you know, when they're trying to buy a piece of equipment, they always sort of sit there and think, well, you know, I, I just want to buy a piece of equipment. All I just want to do is buy a fridge or I want to buy an HPRC. And all I'm getting from procurement is, well, you need to do this, you need to tender or whatever it is. Then you get some, you know, some of the end users who sort of sit there and go, well, look, you know what? I just want to buy the cheapest thing because I want to impress my line manager or it could be that there's budget straight constraints on their, on their work they want to do. And they sometimes sit there and think, well, actually, you know what? I found a cheap piece of equipment or product that I want to buy. But, um, you know, doesn't necessarily consider other things they need to think about. So it's always important that meeting your spec in terms of spec specification of equipment, consumable equipment you need to buy is, you know, is met. And I'll give you an example of a scenario where I had where somebody tried to buy, we, we did some diabetes studies with students and stuff like that. And somebody said to me, oh, look, you know, I found some cheap diabetes strips from a supplier in, in, a, in, in Europe. And I said, well, let's have a look at it. But the trouble was that the terms and conditions weren't really favorable. And also the lead time for those strips were extraordinarily long. So Whilst it's always good to sometimes say, well, look, I find something at a tenth or a fraction of the price, you need to think about all these other things, so the holistic approach, I suppose. There's always that feeling from the end user that they think that they're not considered, so you get some end users who are considered, so you always get Professor X who's always, you know, I want to buy this mass spec and this massive fancy piece of kit, but not always do our, our other end users considered, our technical staff or or research uh, students or other end users who could be using this equipment to consider. So it's always important to try and consider those. Uh, but, you know, they always consider, you know, end users always uh, nowadays think about sustainability, which, and, and they always think sustainable is important, which of course it is. However, there's always that resultant feeling that some people feel like they've paid more for the equipment than they wanted to, not fully understanding why. And then you look at the procurement view which is, you know, you've got regulations, you've got HG policy guidance, that means you need to comply with it. And then, of course, there is the consideration of value-added services. So end users, they just want to buy the equipment. They don't think about servicing. They don't think about warranty. They don't think about spare parts. They don't think about, say, responsible procurement. They just think about, I just want the damn thing in the place. Whereas procurement will think about all these other things. Of course, they think about risk, which is really strange, you know, 
when I first started talking, learning more about procurement, I, I'm, I come from a health and safety background. And when somebody said, we need to do a risk assessment on this, I just looked and went, it's just, it's safe. It's quite safe to use this piece of equipment, but I didn't realize, of course, you need to do a risk assessment in terms of thinking about terms and conditions. You need to think about all these sort of things. And of course, again, sustainability is involved. And then there's, of course, the consideration of responsible procurement. So there's always this end user and procurement battle that always happens. So um, next slide, please. Uh, but they both agree on the same point, and that is that sustainability matters. Um, Next slide, please. Oh, I'm going to love this. this I, I wish I dressed like Prof Witty today, to be honest with you. So the factors that we always try to consider when we try to, when we're purchasing equipment. So, of course, spec is important. You know, what is it that you want it to do? That's very important. But you need to think about the equipment itself. No, the materials that are being used to manufacture those equipment. Are they actually rare minerals? You know, are they going to be extracted in a way that causes harm to the people who live near there, for example? The source of the material itself, are the people who are producing these materials for say equipment or consumables or consumables, are they being treated fairly? When it comes to buying the consumables itself, think about the disposal of that material. So when you're buying equipment, let's use a pipette, okay? You've got a pipette tip. That pipette tip could be contaminated with biological material. It needs to be autoclaved. So you now need to think about an autoclave that generates a lot of heat, takes in a lot of energy. That then needs to undergo that process to uh, be sterilized and destroy the biological material in there. It then moves from there into incineration. So when you think about it, that pipette tip has gone through a lengthy process, which involves a lot of heat, a lot of carbon emissions, and a lot of energy being wasted. Think about the chemicals that are going to be associated with the equipment itself. You know, when they're buying these chemicals, are they disposing of these chemicals safely and in, in a manner which doesn't cause harm to the environment uh, itself? In terms of engineers, when you're buying equipment, you know, the engineers itself, are they local? Do they um, ship the, or do we need to ship the equipment abroad? So, um, you know, you need to think about these things, of course. And of course, you know, when you're buying new equipment and it's replacing current equipment, how do we dispose of those current equipment itself? You know, what's the safe way of disposing of it? Can we actually get the supplier to take it away? Can the parts of it be re recycled in any way so that we can sort of, you know, reuse the bits that are still, you know, working and, you know, things like that. Then, of course, the supply chain issues, but I don't need to educate you all i'm sure you all know there are supply chain issues um, and therefore there are long lead times thanks to uh, you know variety of factors brexit covid and things like that so we need to think about you know how long would it take to get those spare parts so if you've got staff who do maintenance on site they may be asking questions like how long does it take for this stuff to arrive because they need to factor that in in case they need to repair things if the equipment uses batteries how do we safely dispose of them because these batteries will leak out and they could cause dark harm to the environment itself and then of course, you know, it goes without saying, we need to think about energy efficiency of the equipment itself. So these are just the flavor of some of the stuff. There's, there's a wide variety of other things that needs to be considered, but these, this is just a flavor of, of, of the facts itself. Oh, next slide. I was about to press the next button on my keyboard. Next slide, please. So let's use an example, okay? So why does this matter? So an end user I know in our institution bought a gel imager and it was less than 10K. They decided they needed to buy something and off they went. Uh, it was a brand new piece of equipment and unfortunately it failed within six months. So we, you know, they got in touch with the supplier. The supplier suggested a few things, but it didn't work. And they said, right, okay, what we really suggest now is a supplier, an engineer inspection. However, it wasn't gonna be that the engineer is gonna turn up on site at the university, take a look at the equipment or anything like that. It suggested that the equipment had to be sent to Germany itself. So that resulted in the university having to organize a courier and led to a long delay of three months because it was a lot of to in and fro in imports and all this sort of stuff. But the thing that I was trying to get at here is you need to think about the carbon emissions itself. If you're gonna buy a piece of equipment that needs to be sent abroad, you need to think about, you know, is there a way that you can um, not do that in a way? If, can you, can you, can you get a supplier that provides a, a, a local engineer base, for example, where they could um, come and service the stuff, uh, you know, which, which uh, sort of prevents these delays, but also takes into account carbon and things like that emissions. 
And of course, if they're going to be traveling to your institution, do they use electric vehicles, for example? Are they, um, you know, are, are, are they using, if they're not using that, could they use hybrid vehicles? Uh, you know, so these kind of things, you know. So just imagine that piece of equipment had to go to Germany, all those carbon emissions and all the rest of it, that caused a long period of time of delays. But think about these other things that come, uh, could be factored with it. Okay, next slide, please. So let's use some exa examples, some case studies uh, that I've seen over the years. So, um, you know, in terms of other piece of equipment that you could purchase to help reduce the sustainability of an equipment itself, um, I hope I don't um, put people off chemistry for a moment, but uh, University of Edinburgh, they buy, uh, we, we all use rotary evaporators actually for chemistry. The process of this is basically to evaporate an organic solvent. So what you do is you put it under vacuum, reduces the boiling point of that solvent, it comes up, you've got a condenser which has cold water cooling through it, running through it. That vapored organic solvent then drops down into a liquid and therefore you've got your liquid organic solvent and you've got your product. So we use it sometimes in, in my field in drug delivery, for example, where we're trying to extract out the drug itself. Now, this uses a, a lot of water, you know, I mean, you, you, you know, you'll be, you see the example there of how much water it uses, but it uses a lot of water in that process. So what they did was they connected chillers to reduce the amount of water being consumed. And we do this as well at Aston. I think quite a few universities now do this. And what the chiller can do, you can actually cool the chiller down at a lower temperature, which also then reduces the length of time the rotor evaporation process needs to take place. So actually, not only do you save water, but you also save energy as well on the rotor evaporation equipment itself. So this, this process by changing and using chillers itself saved uh, 4,320 meters cubed of water itself, which was enough for 26 four person households for the whole year. And it led to a saving of 8,700 pounds in water costs. Now, of course, there's a cost to, you know, uh, power up the chiller and, 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 and this cost of 320 pounds for the whole year. So actually the result of saving was 840 pounds, 840, 8,430 pounds per year. So that show, goes to show that when you take it still into fact, you know, when you're taking into fact the use of the chiller itself, you save energy and you save uh, costs as well. So yes, chillers have a cost too, uh, but I'll answer questions in a bit. But basically what I'm trying to say is you save uh, in that sense as well. Next slide, please. Bristol, I wouldn't, it wouldn't be fair not to include the University of Bristol. There is a, a really great person in Anna Lewis who does a lot of good work in terms of sustainability. They did a project in which they replaced drying cabinets. So drying cabinets are used to dry glassware itself. However, they are the biggest, uh, if, you, if you've got the old school ones, they leak a lot of heat out everywhere. They replaced 78 chillers, uh, sorry, not chillers, cabinets uh, in, in, in the institution which resulted in 54,000 pounds worth of uh, energy being saved and 396 tons of carbon dioxide being saved as well. So when it comes to buying the equipment, think about other things. So what we're saying is if you were to do a job lot in terms of specification of buying these drying cabinets, think about what other things could you new, uh, could the drying cabinet do in terms of saving uh, energy or being sustainable. So look at considering if they are insulated or if they have an inbuilt uh, timer itself. Next slide, please. There are, of course, consumable take-back schemes. Some suppliers do this as well. So Promega, for example, do a package return in which you uh, can have a polystyrene box uh, returned with a prepaid label to, to Promega for recycling. Um, there is, of course, the Winchester recycling scheme. So these Winchesters are 2.5 litre glass bottles, which are used for organic solvents um, and Fisher and BWR. Uh, certainly, I know they do Winchester recycling schemes, and I believe SLS offer this as well. And there are, of course, um, suppliers such as Style Lab and Grenier who do recycling pipette uh, schemes for pipette boxes as well. So it's not just, um, you know, the equipment itself. Think about the consumables that come into play. Can they take that away? Can they recycle it? When they recycle it, what are they doing with that recycled um, stuff? For example, I know a supplier that had mentioned that they take the pipette tips. They, uh, not pipette tips, they take the pipette boxes that are, are no longer in use, the little wafers that we've got, they shred it down and then you, you actually use it for roads or something like that. So, you know, you can see the effect of how you, your recycling can help the community as well. In terms of consumables, there are some suppliers that also recycle gloves itself. However, I think that, that 
that this game is a little bit in its infancy from what I understand. It's looking at sort of gloves that are uh, not in, because there are, so, you know, you wear gloves to prevent contamination itself. So for example, in radiation in class two or class three biologicals, I reckon you will still need to dispose of it. But if you think about it in terms of a 100% bar of stuff, you're reducing the amount of uh, gloves that are, um, are going to landfill or to waste itself by recycling, using these recycling schemes. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So going back to Edinburgh for a moment, they have done a scheme which is basically looking at single-use laboratory plastics such as cuvettes, petri dishes and falcon tubes. And they do this in a process which involves soaking these plastic ware in 5 to 10 per percent of distel over, <clears throat> over a period of time. Which uh, in which they replace the solutions. So what they're doing is stripping out the, the 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 chemical or the contamination on that plastic ware itself, and then allowing themselves to reuse the stuff itself. However, this only works with uh, hazard group one organisms and inert chemicals and such as buffers. So, again, using that hundred percent bar as as a, as, a, as an example, if you had a lab in and in which the whole hundred percent bar was filled with plastic, and you use this recycling scheme, you could reduce it down. To the point where actually 50% of it is still is gone to say waste or you know autoclave and stuff like that, and that saves in energy costs and things like that. Next slide, please. I wouldn't be right if I didn't touch on responsible procurement for a brief moment. There's a scenario that I faced where an end user had come to me and said, "Oh, I, I'd like to purchase a chiller uh, for a chemistry research facility." So I said, "Yes, go and use uh, approved suppliers. We have framework suppliers." <clears throat> and use uh, use them. There are they pro provide reputable brands. However, the end user identified a cheap chiller from China. Now, they I, I asked for, for more further information about this, and they sent me a website. So, you know, so they sent it to me and said, "Look, you know, let's use this instead of buying it from Company X." You know. So not only were the terms and conditions unfavorable, I mean, they were asking for hundred percent payment up front. They were suggesting that the lead times would be quite long. They said that they would be the equipment wouldn't have a uh, at the time it was CE, but now it's UKCA. I appreciate uh, marking. So there was all sorts of con concerns and alarm bells that were ringing. However, the website showed pictures of the working conditions of the people as well, and it showed a gentleman <clears throat> on the roadway bashing some metal. And I did some further digging, and it was quite shocking to see. The working conditions of those individuals itself. So, <clears throat> pardon me, my throat's drying up. So, when it comes to buying the equipment, not only do you need to think about sustainability and all the other factors that you need to take into effect, we need to think about responsible procurement. And a lot of people think responsible procurement just falls in line with, say, just you know, you know your gloves or, or consumables and stuff like that. But it really falls in line with everything, really. I think you know you need to think about equipment itself. And this example of the chiller is, 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 a, is a shocking case where actually we, we went back to the end user and said, you can't buy this chiller from China because at the end of the day, you know, these are the concerns we've had. The person said, well, I'll buy it off my own credit card. And I said, no, you're not doing that either because you're not having it on Aston because these are the concerns we've got. So we contacted their uh, uh, lead PI and, and, and the head of school and they put a stop to that. So, you know, these are the, you know, the, you know, not only the working conditions, like I say, but there are other reasons why we was trying to prevent this, but luckily we had the backup from the university to stop this from going ahead. Next slide, please. We also, call, <clears throat> we also need to think about, of course, when the equipment is disposed of, how do we dispose of the equipment itself? So there is a supplier called Unigreen that we work with. What they do is they take the equipment away in which either the whole of the equipment or part of the equipment is sold on. So somebody could say, I need a spare part. They contact Unigreen, they say, we've got that spare part. They buy the spare part, put it in and, and try it out and see if it works. The proceeds of which are split between Unigreen and University itself. Aston participates in the scheme and, 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 and so far the results are quite quite pleasing actually. We, um, we uh, they took about 6,800 kilograms of redundant equipment, which have been sold so far with a further 2,605 kilograms in stock, which has resulted in 52,163 kilograms of carbon uh, dioxide emissions uh, being saved so far, which is equivalent of actually an impact of 869 trees or taking 23.7 cars off the road for a year. 
The work with Unigreen also created 1.78 uh, uh, FTE jobs and also led to an indirect job creation in the wider economy. So just think about it. that equipment that you've now recycled or got rid of has led to <coughs> a wider community support itself. Next slide, please. So how do we work on this? How do we try and take it a, a, into account the knowledge and the experience that end users have got and the concerns that procurement have got, and of course, meet our sustainability and procu uh, responsible procurement goals. The first thing I would say is obviously, it goes without saying, liaise with your stakeholders. And these include your hidden ones, uh, and, uh, and the hidden ones could be your technical staff, could be your PIs, could be a lot of other people who are uh, using this equipment, but you always see the face of one person that says, well, I want this piece of equipment and this is what I want to do. I always, I'm a technician, of course I'll say this, I always uh, believe in the knowledge and the value technical staff bring. So I always encourage you to include technical staff who have a wealth of knowledge and experience. They always come up with stuff that you sit there and think, well, I didn't think of that. You know, we had a scenario where um, some, some of our guys were buying some freeze dryers and then one of the technical staff turned around and went, we're going to put it in a room that's going to heat up extraordinarily really high. Why don't you put it in an air-conditioned room? Therefore, they, you know, we can you know, cool down the stuff that we were working with. So, you know, taking on board their knowledge, but also some of our technical staff are quite keen on sustainability and things like that, and they can pass on the knowledge that they've learned. They meet and regularly liaise with suppliers as well. So it's important to take on board their comments as well, I think, and bring them to the table for such a a valuable decision making process like this. It's important to look at the holistic approach. So don't just think about buying the equipment, but how are you going to dispose of it at the end? How does the equipment we purchase benefit not just the research, but everyone around us? In terms of the holistic approach, try and consider the consumables as well. Are they being recycled? What alternatives are there? In terms of chemicals, do we really need to buy such hazardous uh, chemicals itself? Can we actually get away with using safer alternatives? which do not cause any harm to the environment. And then again, with equipment, you know, this is a question that not, not, we don't get a no for, but sometimes I do, which is, do we actually need this equipment? There are often a case where there already is that piece of equipment in the institution. It's just a matter of asking, say, another college or another colleague whether you can use that piece of equipment. So uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> That's my last, um, slide so thank you for listening to me rambling on for a few uh, precious minutes of your time about sustainability and i'll welcome your questions thanks Eugene. that was really interesting